Today on Inside the Issues, I speak with Dr. Elizabeth King about her new book, From Classrooms to Conflict in Rwanda. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. My name is Dr. Andrew Thompson. I'm an adjunct assistant professor of political science at the University of Waterloo and program officer at the Balsley School of International Affairs. Every week on the program, we're joined by an expert in global governance, international public policy, or some other aspect of global affairs here to the studio at the Center for International Governance Innovation. Today, my guest is Dr. Elizabeth King. Hi. Welcome to the show. Thanks very much. Dr. King is a fellow at the Balsley School and a consultant on CG's Africa Initiative project. She's also the author of a new book that just came out, From Classrooms to Conflict in Rwanda. So again, welcome to the show. Thanks for having and me. Congratulations on, on the book. Thank you. Um, what is the central argument of the book? And a lot of people would suggest that it should be the other way around, from conflict to classroom. But you argue that uh, conflict actually began with with education. Can you say a little bit about your, your arguments? Mm -hmm. So the dominant view is that after conflict or in conflict affected and fragile states, education can and does contribute to peace building. And we hope that's true and we work as if it were true. But I ask in this book for us to nuance those presumptions and to step back and to think about the ways in which classrooms, education, I'm talking about primary and secondary schooling, can contribute to conflict. So the ways in which I do that are to look at both the structure of schooling and the content of schooling. So by structure, I mean who has access to schools, and then by content, what's taught, especially in history curriculum, pedagogy, and classroom practices. And I make the case that there's a number of ways in which how that works can actually contribute to underlying conflict. And although the book is about Rwanda, uh, and that's the thread throughout the book, I argue that this idea that classrooms can contribute to conflict stretch far beyond Rwanda. Right. And just building on that, I was really struck in your introduction, at your, your comment that scholars of peace building and of fragile states really downplay or undervalue the role of education in peace building broadly. Um, what led you to that? Conclusion. It's really peculiar, isn't it, that education is this inherently political activity, and yet um, scholars of peace building or peace and conflict and education scholars interact relatively infrequently. So the way I put it in the book is that education is at present at the margins of peace and conflict studies, and what I want to do is bring it to the mainstream. Right. And I think there's a number of reasons why we need to do that and why it's an important time to do that now. And if I could share with you just a couple sure. of facts. One is that in Rwanda and in a number of countries around the world, we have a hugely youthful population. In Rwanda, 50% of the population is under the age of 15. And we see those kinds of trends extend to other parts of the world like Pakistan, Afghanistan, the Middle East, not to mention a number of other sub-Saharan African countries. Pair that with the fact that over half of out-of-school youth around the world live in conflict-affected and fragile states, and then add to that this huge push for getting kids into schools right. with the Millennium Development Goals. So if you think about the confluence of those three factors, in the years to come, we're going to have kids in countries that are most prone to conflict coming into schools and being affected by the content and the structure of schooling. So it's really time for us, as peace and conflict scholars, to be thinking seriously about education. Right. And um, the other, another thing that I was really struck by uh, in the book is the amount of field work mm -hmm. that you did and the, the interviews that you did in order to gather your data. Um, what are some of the, the challenges with doing this kind of work? Um, and, and I wonder if perhaps in a strange way scholars of, of peace building haven't embarked on this type of research before because it is so, so challenging and difficult to do. Well, I don't know if I can claim challenge alone, but um, it, it is uh, difficult to do this kind of research. I can say that the book is based on, uh, in principle, 70 open-ended interviews with people that had been students and or teachers at different times in Rwandan history, because the, the book covers from the colonial period till right. the present. 
I also uh, looked at history curriculum and archival material and had the fascinating opportunity to track down five people that had been colonial administrators or missionaries in Belgium. So these octogenarians were able to give me their views wow. of what it had been like to, to be part of setting up the formal education system in Rwanda. But if I talk about uh, some of the challenges of, of doing this research, which a lot of the field work took place in 2006 and then a follow-up in 2009, so we're talking 12 and 15 years after the genocide, was when talking to people uh, in a context that had fairly recently experienced right. mass violence and asking people to remember things that are potentially very difficult. Uh, another was asking people to share what could be contra-governmental narratives in what right. has become an increasingly authoritarian setting. Right. And then if I could add just a third challenge in the Rwandan case in particular, is that I was looking to speak to individuals that self-identified as both Hutu and Tutsi. But this is a context post-genocide where it's illegal to ethnically identify people. So here I was looking for a, a balanced view, people with various experiences across, across history, but unable to outright ask people one's ethnic identity. So it was hard to find balance in, in conducting the research. But let me say it was really fascinating uh, research to conduct, right. and contrary to many common presumptions, uh, Rwanda is a quite safe place to do research, and it's stunningly beautiful, right. which often surprises people. Right. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. For the next section, I'd like to maybe focus it, the discussion in a little bit more on the, the education system, specifically in Rwanda. We will be back in a moment with Dr. Elizabeth King. You are watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us online at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Welcome back. Elizabeth, I wonder if we could start this section by talking about the specific structure of the education system in Rwanda before the genocide. Um, and so if you could perhaps describe what it was like and how it was socializing young children to, uh, to essentially be divided. Mm -hmm. So in the book, I have three chapters dedicated exclusively to Rwanda. One that looks at the colonial period and the lead up to violence surrounding independence. Another chapter that looks at the independent republics or what some people would call the Hutu republics, which take us from 1962 to 1994. And this is a period that we know ends in civil war and genocide. And then I have a third chapter that looks at the post-genocide period. So from 1994 until today, and you know this month or, or next month, April, will mark the 20th commemoration right. of the Rwandan genocide. So in thinking about education in the lead up to the genocide, I make the case that while education is not a smoking gun, there are a number of ways in which schools slowly contributed to dividing Rwandans rather than bringing them together. So let me give you a few sure. examples. Please. So one would be in terms of access to schools. Historically in Rwanda, there has been preferential access, especially in promotion from primary school to secondary school, for one group of Rwandans or another. So in the period that we're talking, uh, there was a quite intricate quota system that was put in place that restricted access to secondary schools for Tutsi, who had been previously advantaged in the right. colonial period. So it's difficult to judge uh, the merits of this essentially affirmative action program. But in talking to Rwandans, remember, because that was the core of this research, Rwandans told me that it contributed much more to dividing them. People had a grievance on both sides about right. these quotas and that it um, reminded people that they were from different groups and that they were entitled to different things because of their membership in those groups. So aside from access, another factor, and I'm just giving you some examples here, sure. would be classroom practices. So in the period in the lead up to the genocide, it was common practice for teachers to ask students to stand up and to self-identify according to their ethnic identity as part of a census kind of record keeping activity. Right. But in talking to students, they talked about this be bringing really negative attention to the minority, uh, making the minority sometimes fearful 
Uh, and they uh, recall it being paired with an exercise in which the teacher would sometimes uh, describe the stereotypes that one could attribute to Hutu, Tutsi, and, and Twa. Right. And then, of course, I talked to you about the history curriculum. And here I say there, there are a number of narratives that were presented in such a way as to divide Rwandans rather than to help them think about the ways in which they, they could work together. Right. Uh, well, the, the history curriculum was, I think, one of the most fascinating mm -hmm. parts of your book and um, how you describe how these, these narratives really did play into um, these, these notions of identity mm -hmm. that were very divisive. And I wonder if you could maybe elaborate on that a bit. Mm -hmm. So the key mechanisms that I talk about in terms of underlying conflict were essentializing groups, that is, making groups think that they are all the same and entirely different from another group, stereotyping groups uh, and putting usually negative stereotypes, uh, and then inequalities between groups. So I can give you one example in particular, a historical narrative that's really important in the, the Rwandan consciousness, is about what they called the arrival of the populations in Rwanda. Right. Right. So uh, in the colonial period, history went that uh, the three groups arrived sequentially in Rwanda. So Twa were indigenous to Rwanda, Hutu arrived first, cultivating the land, and then a long time afterwards, Tutsi came with their cattle um, and essentially colonized those that were there. And that was what was taught in secondary schools in the colonial period. And the idea was that when Tutsi came, they were foreigners. They right. were from Ethiopia, in line with the Hamitic hypothesis. They were whites in black skin. And thus what was taught was that they were better suited to rule. Right. So then flip that over to the um, post-colonial period in which there was a Hutu government. So that same narrative was taught in terms of the arrival of the populations uh, at the end of primary school and in, it was taught in secondary school as well. But here the meaning had flipped. So the meaning at this time was that Tutsi were foreigners from Ethiopia and that they therefore had less entitlement to the country than others. Uh, and in talking to Rwandans, what really struck me as well was that not only were, was history taught as a historical narrative, but people often felt it was brought into the present as a justification for current action. Sure. And perhaps building on that, post-genocide, has the history curriculum changed? Mm -hmm. um, and, and perhaps even more broadly, has the education system changed? Uh, in order to essentially help come to terms with the events of 1994? Mm -hmm. There have been significant changes to, to the education system. And many of them are very positive and can be praised. And I caution that a number of them replicate some of the conflict conducive practices of the past. In terms of history, which I know is a particular mm -hmm. interest of yours, what's fascinating in Rwanda was that there was a formal moratorium right. on history teaching put in place at the end of the genocide. Uh, and when I was there in 2006 and even 2009, that moratorium had never been formally lifted. Uh, but by the mid-2000s, we saw that the historical narrative was beginning to move into schools through civics curriculum, broader right. social studies, and now there is a, a formal history curriculum, uh, at least at secondary level. But here too, uh, it's you know, in speaking to people, they wanted history to be able to be recounted in such a way as it was one true history, right. that it could present a, an unambiguous historical narrative. People um, suggested there were a number of ways to make this happen, but they wanted it to happen in such a way as history would never divide people again. Right. And yet we know that there are different transcripts, divergent histories that people have experienced and people want to share. And the way in which history is being reintroduced is as a univocal narrative um, that describes history in a way that, that's very much in line with the current government's position and the way that it seeks to justify its uh, maintenance of power. So in looking forward, I think one of the things that, that Rwanda has a challenge in doing is trying to make space for a broader historical narrative, which they haven't right. yet been able to do. And uh, just building that out to the education system, have some of the issues like the quotas, the access that you spoke about in the first segment, have those remained in place or has there mm -hmm. been movement on that front as well? So again, there's been a number of changes and many changes are to be praised. 
as much as um, we can think critically about some of the changes that have been transpired. So I think in a positive sense, uh, the quotas which Rwandans recall as being destructive for intergroup relations were immediately removed. Right. Uh, access is very equitable to primary school. There's still some difficulties in transitioning from primary to secondary school in Rwanda. Uh, and Rwanda has one of the lowest transition rates in Sub-Saharan Africa for, for primary to secondary, at least it has historically. And uh, whereas there is uh, no formal restriction, and we don't talk about ethnicity in Rwanda today, there are still scholarships for genocide survivors okay. to be able to go on to secondary school. Okay. And a number of people associate those to being Tutsi survivors of genocide, thereby kind of replicating some of the grievances right. that they would have had, um, although reversed in terms of who they, they deem to have preferential access from the past. Great. Thank you so much. This is absolutely fascinating. When we come back, I want to um, move the discussion to some of the policy implications uh, of your research. So, We will be back in a moment with Dr. Elizabeth King. You've been watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us online at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on YouTube, and on Twitter. Welcome back. Elizabeth, I wonder if we could shift to some of the policy implications mm -hmm. of, your, of your research. And you note in the book that the international community really has this, this rosy view of Rwanda right now as a country that has turned things around in a relatively short period of time since the, the genocide of, of 1994. Um, so I'll, I'll just throw it out to you, what are some of the the policy implications or recommendations that you might have for both the Rwandan government and the international community that is, or the international actors who are engaged in peace building in Rwanda. Sure, and if I could specify maybe some um, suggestions for people that are interested in education in, in particular. Of course, yep. So uh, at the international level, and I think just at the broadest level, for the Rwandan government too, it would be to say that we've had such a focus on quantity of education. And we've okay. seen that globally with the, the Millennium Development Goals, Universal Primary Education, Education for All. And I would say that this book asks us to say, yes, quantity is important, but let's think about quality, especially through peace and conflict lenses. Right. So that would be one, one high level suggestion. Another would be to think about youth as this really important demographic who are largely overlooked in terms of peace building or, or peace building is done for them. Right. And I would say moving forward we have to think really importantly about children and youth and how to integrate them in education and beyond in a really meaningful way in terms of um, peace building. Now for the Rwandan government in particular I make a number of specific suggestions in the book. So for instance, they have recently changed the language of instruction at all levels of schooling in Rwanda to English right. in a country where historically education has been in Kinyarwanda and in French and where there's really no Commonwealth tie uh, in the past. So one of my particular suggestions is for instance to perhaps slow down the rollout to English uh, and to support it in different ways such that it can be done in a more equitable way because at this time Rwandans are benefiting from it equ uh, inequitably. Right. Another specific suggestion for Rwanda would be in terms of the history curriculum sure. that we've talked about, trying to make space for a broader diversity of views in that history curriculum and space for dialogue and, and critical thinking and critical action. Uh, but I also recognize in terms of making specific recommendations for Rwanda that all of my recommendations come face to face with this political reality of a really restrained, quite authoritative context. And for them to really make a meaningful impact, these educational reforms would have to take place within a broader uh, political reform agenda as well. Right. But if I can be friending, sure. just say there's one thing that I don't think is a policy implication of the book. And that is that I make the case that education can contribute to conflict. Of course, does not mean that no education must build peace. So right. in writing this book, I'm hoping to draw more attention and more, more funding to education, not less. Right. Um, how do you think the Rwandan government will react to your book? Oh, I, I can't pretend to speak for them, right. uh, but my hypothesis would be that there, there are parts of the book that I think they would quite like. Mm 
So for instance, chapter three, which is the analysis of the pre-genocide period, the Hutu governments and what transpired in education there that I argue helped underlie conflict is consistent with what the Rwandan government propounds. So they say that curriculum helped in terms of the self-destruction of the country, for instance, right. and they blame um, bad previous regimes for having taken, taken part in that um, process. So I think uh, they could buy into to that part of the book. I think they would have much more trouble with the parts of the book, uh, chapter four, for instance, that looks at the post-genocide period. Because as you suggested, the international community has looked at Rwanda through very positive lenses right. in, the, in these past 20 years in general. And chapter four brings a little bit more critiques, saying that um, the Rwandan government has made some remarkable progress. But there are a number of ways in which um, schools in particular contribute or continue to contribute to dividing Rwandans. Uh, and I think that because they have one narrative that they stick to, and it's a, a very positive narrative about the way that they're governing and the way that they're reintroducing history, I suspect that they'd have quite a lot of trouble with that chapter. So on this issue of securing more funding for education, uh, in the book, you introduce the idea of the securitization of education. What do you mean by this, and uh, and how is this framework useful for getting resources for education? Mm -hmm. I think it's useful, and it's potentially dangerous. So one way to think about the argument that I make in the book is to say that I've made education a security concern. Right. We usually think about it as important human right, we think about it as crucial to development, but we don't always think about it as important for security. And if we were to think about it as important for security in countries um, that are experiencing the education system and beyond, that might garner more funding. Right. Because we know that there's a lot more funding given to security sure. than to, say, education. Right. Uh, but that said, I'm at the same time worried about, yes, this securitization of education. So in that we see in development studies too, the securitization of development. And by that I mean thinking about education or thinking about development by and for rich and powerful states as opposed to thinking about education with youth and children and those that we, we are most important really at its center. So I think mean, there could be gains and there could be important losses in thinking about education as a security issue. And I hope that people that are trying to garner more funding for education might be able to harness the positives out of that relationship. Great. Well, thank you very much. This is wonderful. For the last section, I'd like to conclude by talking a little bit about the political climate in Rwanda in 2014. So we will be back in a moment with Dr. Elizabeth King. You've been watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us online at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on YouTube, and on Twitter. Welcome back. Elizabeth, I wonder if we might end today's episode by talking about the political climate in Rwanda. Mm -hmm. And in the book, you, uh, you're very quick to note that despite a lot of the progress that has been made and the very positive initiatives that the government has, has implemented, there are still some very serious human rights issues in the country. And I wonder if you could say a little bit about the political climate and these, these rights abuses. Sure. So some of the good news, and it's usually the good news that we hear about in the press, are things like the fact that in terms of security, there's been no return to large-scale violence. Uh, in terms of political institutions, um, we've seen relative stability. There have been elections, even if they've been flawed, they've uh, gone on peacefully. Uh, we see in Rwanda that has the record of the largest number of women right. in the lower house, or largest percentage of women in the lower house, I think at last count, 56 percent. Wow. And we see really tremendous economic progress as well. I think of late it's been about 8 percent growth per year, even though of course the majority of Rwandans continue to live in grueling poverty. Right. But yes, there's this but, and it's the but that we don't usually hear about. And so at the same time uh, as there has been um, some level of political security, that's been at the cost of uh, a number of things. So um, Rwandans with whom I spoke, for instance, 
um, felt uncomfortable sharing their genuine political opinions in public. There's a, a quite vague law called divisionism, okay. which is meant to eradicate genocide ideology, but it increasingly is being used for, for anyone who disagrees with the government, okay. and you can end up in jail on a wow. divisionism charge. Um, we also see that the government um, or, or the broader RPF was involved in a number of human rights violations in the Civil War, in the genocide, uh, in the aftermath of the genocide, but justice today is being administered in such a way as those crimes being excluded from what's um, within the realm of the justice system. We also, of course, know that Rwanda has been involved in several large-scale wars in the DRC sure. next door. So I took it really seriously that when I spoke with Rwandans, they would tell me things like, I can't say things, but maybe you can. Uh, and I took that a, as a responsibility. Um, and I think that, uh, thinking more broadly, the international community has done great disservice to Rwanda in the past uh, by not being vocal about things. So as much as I praise the Rwandan government for a number of really positive developments that they've made, I don't think we're doing them or Rwandan citizens any favors by not also bringing to light the continued challenges that remain for peace building. Right. And I'm going to ask you a terribly unfair question. You mentioned in your last answer that there hasn't been a, a recurrence of, of wide-scale wide violence. And given the role of education in essentially socializing hate or, or divisions with, between groups, um, given some of the, the changes that have taken place, uh, both positive and negative, do you think that a re-eruption of mm -hmm. wide-scale violence is, is a real possibility for Rwanda, or have they put that are they be put that behind mm -hmm. them? Yeah, of course, that's a really <laughs> difficult question. And I deeply hope for the many wonderful Rwandans that I met and their countrymen and women uh, that we would not see a return to violence. But I couldn't yet answer that it's not a possibility because there is so much still to be done in terms of meaningful peace building. Right. So in terms of education, I think the Rwandan government puts great hope and responsibility in youth, and I think that that's the right thing to do. Uh, if one visits the genocide memorial, for instance, the main genocide memorial in Kigali, the last panel on display says, education has become our way forward. And, and I think that too is really powerful, and I approach the book as a great believer in the power and the promise of education. But, uh, in making the case that classrooms themselves can contribute to conflict, there still need to be a number of reforms in the education system and beyond in order for me to answer your question definitively, like that this couldn't be a, a possibility. Right. Maybe just to end, I can share with you that the last line from the book, I borrow from an African proverb that says, um, the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. So yes, the, the best time to have made huge changes in terms of political climate and in terms of education, in terms of all these other peace building goals was 20 years ago. But, you know, the proverb goes on, the second best time is now. Right, right. So, so I would say that, that that remains true. Right, well, thank you so much, Elizabeth. Thanks. This has been absolutely wonderful and, and fascinating. Congratulations again on, on having the book come out. Um, and thank you to our audience for joining us. Please join us again uh, for another episode of Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us online at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube.